So I know the title sounds very crazy, but before you take it too far, Natalie Cole was not some, you know, nefarious, dark and evil woman just trying to destroy the lives of others. She was a troubled and wounded little girl who grew up to be an adult that was just stuck in some troubling, destructive patterns, trying to escape her mother, her life, and just was very unhappy and unfortunately she found herself in some very dark situations she grew to regret as she got older and i applaud her for her transparency on speaking about her substance use and also dealing with luring men to sleep with girls and all of these things <sighs> i applaud her transparency we're going to talk about all of that and more and how she got beat with a bible that is crazy. But before we get into all of this, hey friend, welcome to my channel, Crane Allude, where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars through history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so. And if you're already subscribed, please be sure to turn on your notification bell so you never miss an upload. Now let's get into this video. Before we get into the darker themes of this video, I do want to start with her childhood and the inception of Natalie Cole. How did she come to this and her triumphant career? and also her troubling marriages. Let's start with her childhood. So Natalie Cole was born on February 6, 1950. She stepped into the world as Cedars of Lebanon Hospital in Los Angeles, California. She was the offspring of two legendary figures in American music, Nat King Cole, a singer and jazz pianist of unparalleled fame, and Maria Hawkins Ellington, a former singer with the Duke Ellington Orchestra. And I haven't done a video for Nat King Cole yet, but I will, but since March is Women's Month, I'm only doing women for this month, but after March, I definitely will do a video for Nat King Cole. So Natalie grew up in the affluent Hancock Park District of Los Angeles, an area she fondly referred to as home to the Black Kennedys and she considered her family the Black Kennedys, which they were. From a young age, Natalie was exposed to the rich tapestry of jazz, soul, and blues. Thanks to her parents' deep roots in the music industry, Nat King Cole, her father, was a huge deal. Still, I listen to him today, and when I do his video, you're gonna be like, oh, he sings that, he sings this. You hear him every Christmas, every holiday. He sings one of my favorite songs of all time, which is Unforgettable, which she did a duet with him on. Ugh, I just love not king girl at just 11 years old she made her singing debut on her father's 1960 christmas album the magic of christmas natalie's family consisted of her older adopted sister carol cookie cole her adopted brother nat kelly cole and younger twin sisters timeline and casey Despite the idyllic image painted by a childhood in Hancock Park, the Cole family faced their share of adversity. Being the only black residents in the predominantly white neighborhood, they were met with racial resistance. The hostility escalated to the point where the N-word was burned into their lawn and their pet dog was killed with poisoned meat. Natalie's recollections of her childhood home are filled with vivid memories of music, laughter, and warmth. She remembered her mother sitting in their library after school, sipping on vodka and grapefruit juice, with music always playing in the background. Her father, on the other hand, enjoyed watching boxing and baseball on TV or listening to records by his musician friends. Their home was a hub for many celebrities, including Lena Horne, Dorothy Dandridge, Ella Fitzgerald, and Louis Armstrong. However, Natalie's mother's high society aspirations often led to a disconnect between Natalie and the Black community. Natalie's mother desired her children to interact with a different society, one that existed outside their home. Singer Natalie Cole says her mother's snobbery isolated her from other Blacks during childhood. She said, and I quote, when I got friendly with the Black people, 
people who worked for us, my mother was appalled. Miss Cole recently told Parade she wanted us to interact with a different society outside the house. The singer also reveals that her mother's family felt that her late father, famed singer Nat King Cole, was too black for them. For a dark-skinned man such as my father to acquire a light-skinned woman such as my mother was a real important prize, Miss Cole explains. Your status moved up. That doesn't mean that her family was all that happy about her marrying her father. He was too black for them. Her mother was very socially conscious and she didn't want my mother to get involved with anyone with too many black characteristics because then your children would look quote unquote funny, end quote. Miss Cole adds, it wasn't just my mother, it's the way many black people were raised during that era, which is so true. Natalie didn't start to love herself and really engage with other people of color, like black people, until she got into college and started going to Black Panther rallies and speeches and stuff like that because her mom really isolated her from that. And her mom really believed that she was just refining them and also Nat King Cole. Like her mom was quoted as saying in her biopic that Nat King Cole had the talent, but she had the polish. So she married him and polished him up, if you will, into higher society. So she was obsessed in a sense with higher society and that really troubled Natalie. Natalie's schooling began at Northfield School for Girls, an elite New England preparatory school. However, her life took a tragic turn when her father died of lung cancer in February 1965. This marked the beginning of a strained relationship with her mother. At 15, Natalie had to find a way to deal with a personal tragedy that was also a very public event. My mother worked hard to create this controlled exterior, which she continues to this day, she says. I don't think I ever really bawled or cried. That creates a pocket that you put all your stuff into and it soon gets too heavy to carry, end quote. A week after the funeral, Natalie was in trouble for shoplifting. Her mother, appalled by the shame it brought on the family, sent her to a psychiatrist. Her mother literally would not allow the children to grieve and was telling them like crying was a sign of weakness and we just got to move on. Natalie also recalled in her movie, which she narrated the film, you know, so it was her own voice narrating it. She even played her older self in the film so it could be more accurate. Very wonderful. She showed how when she found out her father died, she came back from the preparatory school and didn't know her father was even sick her mom didn't even let them know and when she begged her mom and said i don't want to go back to school i want to stay here with you i want to help the family like she just wanted to be around her family her dad just died her mom was like no you're going back to the school and shipped her off these things really scarred natalie and she just did not get the comfort or the attention she needed to grieve her father and her father was her life she loved him and he loved her he really loved his kids you know but her mother didn't have that same warmth that her dad did she just couldn't even grieve it but they did end up making amends later on in life and they started working on their relationship so that was a good thing also but for that period natalie was starting to really be troubled her major driving force were confusion over her identity and rebellion against her father's name i continually acted up to get attention she says my father gave me that and once he left i felt that i didn't have any i also felt resentful about having to live up to certain standards because I am the daughter of Nat King Cole. I was saying, I'm not perfect. Now let me show you how not perfect I am, end quote. Natalie atten attended the Buckley School, a private institution in Sherman Oaks, California, before enrolling in the University of Massachusetts. Amherst. She briefly transferred to the University of Southern California where she pledged an Upsilon chapter of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. Eventually, she returned to the University of Massachusetts where she completed her major in child psychology and a minor in German graduating in 1972. However, university life introduced Natalie to recreational substance use of coke, and LSD, a habit that would come to cast a long shadow over her life. Despite the trials and tribulations that lay ahead, Natalie Cole's journey was just beginning, a journey that would see her follow in her parents' footsteps to become a legendary figure in American music. Now let's shift over to her career. Born to the legendary Nat King Cole and jazz singer Maria Cole, Natalie Cole was destined for musical greatness. Growing up in the affluent Hancock Park district of Los Angeles, she was exposed to a variety of music that included the 
the soulful tunes of Aretha Franklin and the raw energy of Janis Joplin. And after graduating in 1972, Natalie began her musical journey singing at small clubs with her band, Black Magic. The club owners initially welcomed her due to her famous lineage, but were taken aback when she started belting out cover versions of R&B and rock songs instead of her father's jazz classics. And she just refused to sing her father's songs. She didn't want to live in his shadow and also her mother didn't want her to sing her father's songs. In a twist of fate, songwriting and producing duo Chuck Jackson and Marvin Yancey offered to help Natalie record some songs in a studio owned by Curtis Mayfield in Chicago. Her demo tapes got the attention of Capitol Records, leading to a contract and the release of her debut album, Inseparable, in 1975. The album reminiscent of Aretha Franklin's style was an instant success with This Will Be, becoming a top 10 hit and winning Natalie a Grammy Award for Best Female R&B Vocal Performance. Natalie broke new ground by becoming the first African-American artist to win the Grammy Award for Best New Artist. However, this achievement sparked a rivalry between Natalie and Aretha Franklin, who was being toted as the new Aretha Franklin by the media. The feud reached its peak at the 1976 Grammy Awards when Natalie won the Best Female R&B Vocal Performance category, a title Franklin had won eight times before losing to Natalie. Undeterred by critics who predicted a sophomore slump, Natalie released her second album, Natalie in 1976, which, like its predecessor, achieved gold status. She continued her successful streak with her third album, Unpredictable, which went platinum, thanks largely to the number one R&B hit, I've Got Love on My Mind. Later in 1977, she released her second platinum album of the year, Thankful, which included another hit, Our Love. In doing so, Natalie became the first female artist to release two platinum albums in a single year. Her skyrocketing fame led to her own TV special, attracting high-profile guests like Earth, Wind & Fire. She also appeared on the TV special Sinatra and & Friends. And in 1978, Natalie released her first live album, Natalie Live, and in 1979, she was awarded a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. That same year, she released two more albums, I Love You So, and the Peebo Bryson duet album, We're the Best of Friends. Both albums reached gold status in the U.S., a testament to Natalie's enduring personality. From her humble beginnings, singing in small clubs, to becoming one of the most celebrated artists of her generation, Natalie Cole's journey was nothing short of extraordinary. In the early 1980s, Natalie Cole's life took a turn for the worse. Her struggles with substances began to overshadow her talent, causing her career to take a backseat. In 1983, after releasing her album I'm Ready under Epic Records, she made the difficult decision to enter a rehab facility in Connecticut. For six months, she battled her demons away from the public eye. However, the depths of Natalie's addiction was more severe than anyone could have imagined. In her 2000 autobiography, Angel on My Shoulder, she revealed a shocking truth. At the height of her addiction in 1973, she had been so consumed by her dependence on, you know, heroin that that she was unable to work and began losing jobs desperate for money and with her career spiraling out of control natalie found herself working for a pimp named ronnie in harlem she was tasked with attracting customers looking for women to sleep with a role she insisted didn't involve selling her own body but she facilitated you know other women selling their bodies her life during this period was marked by chaos and danger. She was hanging around shady people. She was in back alleys. And there was times that she would go to purchase, you know, substances and powders to snort. And the addicts, the addicts that would be around her shooting up and stuff would have radios in these back alleys playing music. Because, you know, when you're under the influence, you want to hear music. And her songs would be playing. And they wouldn't even be able to recognize that it's her that's coming to buy the substance. That's how down bad she was and a lot of people didn't know much about addiction at that time so people were really hard on her like why don't you just quit why don't you just stop like as if it was so easy and she desperately did want to stop but the substance really consumed her and she just could not there was a terrifying incident where she refused to leave a burning building and another where her young son robert nearly drowned in their family pool while she was you know high it was these harrowing experiences that led her to seek help and 1983. Natalie's autobiography was released alongside a TV movie, Living for Love, The Natalie Cole Story. I love this. Made me teary and it's here free on YouTube. If you look it up, Living for Love, The Natalie Cole 
whole story and she appears on it she plays herself she narrates it really deep the movie aired on nbc in december 2000 and was re-aired on centric tv in october 2011. it gave viewers an intimate glimpse into natalie's battle with addiction and her journey towards redemption and despite her troubled past, Natalie managed to stage a remarkable comeback. When many people didn't want to work with her, they didn't trust her, they felt like, you're no longer bankable, you're a junkie, we don't want nothing to do with you. She proved them wrong. Feel that she had the opportunity to make any kind of a comeback and that her career as a recording artist was over. So it was very, very difficult. It took about five years to kind of get back to the place where I felt, at least professionally, that I could stand up next to a few people. In 1991, she released her best-selling album, Unforgettable With Love, under Elektra Records. This album saw Natalie covering songs recorded by her father, something she had previously refused to do during live concerts. The album was a resounding success, selling more than 7 million copies in the U.S. alone and winning several Grammy Awards, including Album of the Year, Record of the Year, and Best Traditional Pop Vocal Performance. And one of the most important moments of this is that Natalie's mother, never wanted her to sing and wanted only one singer in the family which was their father because her own mother gave up her career for Nat King Cole when she married Nat King Cole she was just like hey I'm just gonna push your career and give up my career because her mother was a singer too so she didn't really push or encourage the children to get into singing even though they knew how to sing so for a very long time Natalie used to sing when she was in college with her bands in private her mom didn't know her family didn't know it would all be a secret she eventually told her mom and her mom was not happy about it so her mom was never really happy of her career right up until she wanted to cover the song and do the song with Nat King Cole. And she did the song as a duet using, you know, AI technology and stuff. And it was a very touching moment for Natalie because her mother ended up coming into the studio to hear it. And that was kind of a healing moment for both of them. She did. Unforgettable. The highlight of the album was its title track, which used new studio technology to pair Natalie and Nat in a magical duet. When they did it the first time, I cried, of course. I just broke down. I, it was very hard for me. I don't listen to my husband's music very much, and uh, um, this was very, very difficult. Mom actually came down to one of the sessions here in Los Angeles, and I was overjoyed that, that she would even do that, because my mom is very protective of my dad's memory. I think she was really quite moved. By the whole process of it. So following the success of Unforgettable with Love, Natalie released another album of jazz standards, Take a Look, in 1993. She also made her mark in television, taking on the lead role in the TV movie Lily in Winter. It's not all happy just yet. Let's talk about her marriages, okay? She was married three times, each union marked by its own unique trials and tribulations. Her first marriage was to Marvin Yancey, a songwriter, producer, and former member of the 1970s R&B group, The Independents. They tied the knot in July July 1976 in Chicago and had a son Robert Adam Robbie Yancey who would later tour with her as a musician. Marvin was not just her producer but also an ordained Baptist minister who reintroduced Natalie to religion. Natalie and Marvin divorced in 1980 and five years later Marvin tragically died of a heart attack at just 34. In her televised biopic Natalie revealed the shocking truth that she had introduced Marvin to substances and he would get high with her before stepping onto the pulpit like he would be preaching high that's crazy despite acknowledging that she was a negative influence on his life Natalie confessed that Marvin was the love of her life and she took full accountability in that biopic and she showed that yeah I took him he was all holy when he first met me he was a good guy all this whatever and I basically destroyed him kind of remind me of Whitney and Bobby don't worry I'm working on something for that too but in 1989, Natalie married Andre Fisher, a record producer and former drummer for the band Rufus on the surface. They appeared to be the picture of marital bliss. However, behind closed doors, Natalie was enduring an abusive relationship. Andre had a volatile temper and he frequently unleashed it on Natalie. Their marriage was a vicious cycle of separation and reconciliation, with Natalie constantly battling poor self-esteem and feeling overshadowed by her father's legacy, and he would use that against her. He was also very jealous of her success he wanted the same amount of success as she did and he just didn't like being married to such a successful woman but natalie's triumph came at an unfortunate price the kind of success that unforgettable gave to me as well as to my then husband andre it was a little overwhelming he wanted very much to win for producer of the year and he didn't get it 
we were already experiencing problems in our relationship, and that didn't help any. It was a big night. Sooner or later, it just, you know, bit by bit, it just really crumbled. In 1995, Natalie filed for divorce, revealing the extent of the abuse she had suffered. She alleged that Andre had hit her in the chin with a Bible, slammed her against a wall, and torn her clothes while Andre claimed these were accidents. Friends and family knew the truth. Andre was a bully, and he made excuses for the Bible thing, and because I guess she was holding a Bible while they were fighting. She was holding it, trying to, like, protect herself or shield herself, and he wanted to get to her and still hit her so he yanked the bible while he's yanking it from her it just hit her in the chin really hard which is just sick and demonic can you imagine like someone's holding a bible while i'm fighting with them i don't think i could continue the fight <laughs> that's where we wrap it up because i don't want trouble with the lord <laughs> but yeah that was pretty tragic natalie's third and final marriage was to bishop kenneth dupree in 2001 however this union also ended in divorce in 2004 and despite the heartbreak and turmoil she experienced in her personal life natalie remained a beloved figure in the world of music okay so now let's talk about our ending year which unfortunately I, I hope I could say got better but it did get better in the sense that she was clean she wasn't using anymore she was on the right path she was reconnecting with God grateful blessed etc but still tragedy was right around the corner in 2000 Eight, the world was shocked when Grammy-winning singer Natalie Cole revealed a deeply personal secret. She had been diagnosed with hepatitis C, a life-threatening liver disease. The virus, which is spread through contact with infected blood, had remained dormant in her body for over two decades. Twenty years it was in her body without her knowing. The cause? Her past substance use, the needles. During an interview in 2009, Natalie confessed that she said, Hep C stayed in my body for 25 years and it could still happen to addicts who are fooling around with substances, especially needles, end quote. Just four months into her treatment for Hep C, Natalie suffered kidney failure, a devastating blow that required her to undergo dialysis three times a week for nine months. And despite this, she continued to perform, her indomitable spirit shining through her music. However, in December 2015, Natalie's health took a turn for the worse. She was forced to cancel several events due to her illness, and her last musical performance was a short set of three songs in Manila, and sadly on December 31st, 2015, the day before the new year of 2016, she did not get to see the new year. Natalie passed away at the age of 65 at the Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. The official cause of death was congestive heart failure. Her family revealed that it was a complication of idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension those words tripped me up a condition she had been diagnosed with after her kidney transplant in 2009 her family statement reads natalie fought a fierce courageous battle dying how she lived with dignity strength and honor our beloved mother and sister will be greatly missed and remain unforgettable in our hearts forever natalie's funeral took place on january 11 2016 in los angeles the service was attended by David Foster, Stevie Wonder, Smokey Robinson, Lionel Richie, Shaka Khan, Eddie Levert, Mary Wilson, Gladys Knight. Other notable attendees included Jesse Jackson, Angela Bassett, Denise Nicholas, Marla Gibbs, Jackie Harry, and Frida Payne. Following the funeral, Natalie was laid to rest at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California. Natalie Cole's story serves as a stark reminder of the dangers of substance use. Despite the glamorous facade of her life, she battled demons that eventually led to her on time death. Her legacy, however, lives on through her unforgettable music and her courageous fight against addiction and disease. And I must say, I just love her transparency. I love her accountability. And I love how she really fought to be a positive force. And a time where people really didn't know about addiction, she really brought a lot of awareness and was not ashamed to talk about it. And it's sad how she went, but give her flowers in the comment section and it just goes to show you like I did the video for Etta James and her and Fergie all of these people they appear so glamorous and have the money and have the nice gowns the fame their name is in lights and behind the scenes they're all people just like us capable of heartbreak capable of depression of sadness and feeling lost and that is enough to have empathy I love you guys so much. If you like the music you're listening to, the link is in the description. Thumbs up this video. Leave flowers in the comments for Natalie Cole. May she rest in peace. And comment below who else would you guys like to see a video from. Until next time.